from Edmund Pettus Bridge to uh, the Freedom Bridge. And the state of Alabama last year passed a law that said you cannot change the names of any of these uh, so-called iconic white supremacist symbols. That was attorney and civil rights activist Faye Ora Rose Touré and before her, former Alabama state senator Hank Sanders speaking to Jeffrey Robinson, who is the subject and writer of this remarkable documentary that's called Who We Are, a chronicle of racism in America. Emily and Sarah Kunstler direct it. We thank you all so much for being with it. That does it for our show. I wish everyone a safe Martin Luther King Day weekend. I'm Amy Goodman. Wear a mask. Cabo Community Radio is a proud co-sponsor of the 19th Annual Silverton MLK Observance on Monday, January 19th from 6 to 7 p.m., streaming online. Racial and social justice activist Ajama Umi will deliver a keynote presentation addressed, Does American Identity Equal White Supremacy? This MLK Observance will also feature a Q&A session, songs, and readings. Again, that's the 19th Annual Silverton MLK Observance on Monday, January 19th from 6 to 7 p.m., streaming online. More information can be found at kboo.fm on the right side of the homepage under Community Events. Join KBOO every Friday at 5.30 p.m. for Counterspin, a show that provides a critical examination of major media stories and exposes what the mainstream media missed. Counterspin exposes and highlights censored stories, sexism, racism, and homophobia in the news, the power of corporate influence, gaffes and goofs by leading TV pundits, and more. That's every Friday at 5.30 p.m. here on your community radio station. KBOO Portland. And now, your daily volunteer produced community newscast, the KBOO Evening News. Coming up on the KBOO Evening News one in three Metro Public School students faces school closures. The Oregon Department of Justice investigates a for profit COVID testing company. And Emergency rental assistance resumes January 26. Good evening. This is the KBU Evening News for Friday, January 14th, 2022. I'm Josh Salem. One in three metro area public school students are facing school closures because of COVID-19. Four area school districts closed today, North Clackamas, Gresham Barlow, Reynolds, and Centennial. They'll all reopen Tuesday after the Martin Luther King Day holiday, except for Reynolds, which will close until Wednesday. The districts are closing because of the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, which has caused many students and staff to be absent, either because they were ill or they were caring for infected family. Five Portland public schools are moving to online learning this week, days after the school district accused unionized teachers of coordinating sick absences in order to force schools to close. 75,000 area public school kids are now moving back to online. 
Oregon officials announced new plans to help keep the already strained health care system afloat during the Omicron surge. Oregon Health Authority Director Patrick Allen said the state will deploy 1,200 Oregon National Guard members to do administrative support for hospitals. They also plan to bring in out-of-state health care workers and add testing services at 10 high-volume vaccine sites. Oregon has the 15th lowest COVID case rate in the country, but the case spike load is still severe since the Omicron variant is so much more transmissible. The health authority says they will shift away from focusing so much on case counts since many people's positive results are at home and not reported to the state. They plan to put more emphasis on the rates of hospitalizations and death. The OHA also launched a new website for people to report their at-home test results to public health officials. The Oregon Department of Justice is investigating a for-profit COVID testing company that state and county health officials say they have no oversight over. The Center for COVID Control is a for-profit testing service in 29 states, including three locations in the Portland metro area. Many other testing sites in the state are run by or affiliated with state and county health departments. Health officials have oversight over these partners, but not for-profit testing centers. Testing supplies are severely limited and demand is high. Many people need the test because of exposure or because of work or school. The Department of Justice received two complaints since the center opened in October of 2021, and it is now conducting a civil investigation into the company and its testing practices. Other states are looking into the Center for COVID Control too. A news outlet in Florida reported that a family received their negative results by email while they were still in line for the test. As of Thursday morning, when the investigation was announced, all three locations have been temporarily closed. Oregonians needing emergency rental assistance will have another opportunity to get support. The Oregon Housing and Community Services Application Portal reopens January 26th. The applications for rent assistance were closed on December 1st, when officials said all of the $289 million for rental help in the state were already spent. State lawmakers met in December to pass new eviction protections and add $100 million to the rent assistance program. That program still has between five and 8,000 renters who are eligible for help, but haven't gotten funds yet. More information can be found online at oh-e-r-a-p.oregon.gov. A variety of issues combine to make access to high-quality, affordable childcare especially difficult in Oregon. On average, families are spending 30% of their monthly income on childcare. Eric Tegetoff has more. Finding and affording childcare is no cakewalk for Oregon families right now. A new report details the pressures and some potential policy fixes. The average Oregon family spends 30% of its monthly income on child care. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, families should spend no more than 7%. Joni Schuler is with Our Children Oregon, which is taking a closer look at these issues. We're seeing that these lack of providers, the burnout there, as well as the lack of slots and availability to access is impacting every single socioeconomic group, and then certainly disparities exist among racial and ethnic lines as well. We're seeing Black and Latinx families in particular really struggling to afford and access care. Schuler says wages for child care workers are among the lowest of any profession, affecting a workforce largely made up of women and people of color. Nearly one in seven child care centers in Oregon faces staffing shortages. Schuler adds the pandemic has created additional hurdles, both for families and providers. Schuler says Oregon should reduce barriers for establishing child care homes and centers to improve access in those areas considered to be child care deserts in the state. She adds the federal government can do more to improve wages for providers and bolster subsidy programs for parents, such as the child tax credit. Expanding the availability and the accessibility of care and then really investing in our workforce and ensuring that they're getting their needs met and really invested at that governmental level. Our Children Oregon also suggests investments to ensure the availability of care and education services that are developmentally and culturally responsive and in multiple languages. Schuler says ultimately this is about children. She says kids need trained providers to support proper child development in their first five years. We're really seeing a lot of impact on the children long term too. We're not just talking short term, but on the long term trajectories of their development. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. 
State officials agree that a statewide housing shortage is driving up home prices and worsening the houseless crisis. But they say relief is at least a year away. Lawmakers won't consider changes until the 2023 session, since this year's session is only 35 days. Disparities between the positions of officials and community advocates were revealed at the 2022 Housing Economic Summit on Thursday. Speakers noted that the statewide housing shortage is driving up home prices, increasing the number of people forced to live on the street, and preventing many people of color from purchasing a starter home to build wealth. They say lawmakers could address this by looking at the state land use planning laws, which can limit the amount of buildable land. They also flag policies intended to increase energy efficiency and fight climate change. They could be pushing prices up too high. Jeff Harris is the Customer Experience Director for Hayden Homes, which builds middle-income housing. Harris said at the summit, quote, for every $1,000 of additional cost, 1,578 Oregonians are priced out of the market, end quote. An affordable housing funding bill will likely be considered this year, and in the meantime, there's action that can be taken at the county and city levels. Panelists suggested that the permit process could be sped up, and that cities could be sure that their buildable land is actually okay to build on, not overestimated to keep from changing zoning laws. Oregon State Capitol Building has been famous for being accessible, no longer. Legislative administrators announced on January 13th that metal detectors and x-ray machines will be installed at select entry points. At least 33 other state houses have also ramped up their security. Until recently, visitors with concealed carry handgun licenses were allowed to bring guns into the Oregon State House. In 2020, a Republican lawmaker allowed demonstrators with weapons into the locked building, and a Senate bill was passed banning all firearms. Details of the security changes at our Capitol are still being worked out. Machinery will be installed next week at four different entrances, two open to the public and two restricted to lawmakers and staff. New protocols begin January 27th, before the 2022 legislative session begins. It is not clear how those with 24-7 access will be screened outside of normal business hours. Public entrances will have x-ray machines for checking bags. Those restricted to lawmakers and staff will include metal detectors. Adding security to Capitol buildings across the nation has been surprisingly controversial. Some feel this impedes government access. There has been little reaction, however, to the Oregon announcement. Oregon State Police Captain Stephanie Bigman said, quote, the addition of this equipment and screening process will bring the security of the Capitol up to levels commonly seen in courthouses around the state. This will in no way restrict access to the public, but will assist in making sure every citizen is safe while in the building, end quote. Senate President Peter Courtney said, quote, I feel bad about it, very bad, because I love the fact Oregon had probably the last open capital in the nation. But now, here we go, end quote. The U.S. House passes a new voting rights bill, setting up a Senate showdown, and President Biden announces expanded COVID testing. With those stories and more, it's Jonah Chester with 2022 Talks. Welcome to 2022 Talks, where we are following our democracy in historic times. I stand here in the name of the blood shed by those foot soldiers, Dr. Martin Luther King and John Robert Lewis, who shed his blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It was all eyes on voting rights Thursday on Capitol Hill as both chambers of Congress continued the fight over the future of the filibuster. On a party line vote, Democrats in the House passed a new version of the bill designed to trigger a fight on filibuster reform in the Senate. Democratic Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas was one of several members of the House Black Caucus who spoke in favor of the bill. My friends who vote no today will disregard and ignore that bloodshed. I refuse to ignore the blood that was shed for the right to vote. As it stands, Democrats would need 60 votes to pass the measure. If the filibuster is suspended, the bill could pass with a simple majority. In a symbolic move, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he plans to put the bill to a vote by this coming Monday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. If the right to vote is the cornerstone of our democracy, then how can we in good conscience allow for a situation in which the Republican Party can debate and pass voter suppression laws at the state level with only a simple majority vote, but not allow the United States Senate to do the same. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell accused Democrats of trying to force a federal takeover of elections and argued there are more important issues Congress should be focusing on. 
Now, there's a path forward for my Democratic colleagues to respond to the country they have so badly disappointed. But it isn't to try to break the Senate and rewrite election laws. It's to actually start tackling the issues that American families need tackled. The filibuster reform effort and therefore the voting rights bill will likely fail. As Democratic Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona remain opposed to the rule change. While I continue to support these bills, I will not support separate actions that worsen the underlying disease of division infecting our country. As the Omicron variant continues surging, President Joe Biden has announced plans to increase availability of at-home COVID-19 tests. In December, the White House announced it would order 500 million at-home tests. Thursday, President Biden said they would double the order. I mean, a billion tests in total to meet future demand. And we'll continue to work with the retailers and online retailers to uh, increase availability. Meanwhile, the U.S. Supreme Court Thursday rejected the president's vaccinate or test requirement for businesses with at least 100 employees. The president is pushing for large employers to institute their own vaccine requirements. According to the Associated Press, at least a third of Fortune 100 companies have already done so. The court did allow the administration to push forward with a vaccine requirement for health care workers. I'm Jonah Chester for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Find our eight trust indicators to support transparency and accuracy at publicnewsservice.org. You're listening to the KBOO Evening News. Stay tuned after this newscast for Counterspin, your look behind the headlines, produced by fairness and accuracy in reporting. At 6, it's Let's Talk About Race. And at 7, Hard Knock Radio. Tonight's weather will be partly cloudy, with an overnight low of 37. Tomorrow, those clouds continue, with a daytime high of 48 degrees. Today in history, in 1967, the Human Bee Inn takes place in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, launching the Summer of Love. The quote of the day is from French-Cuban-American novelist Anais Nin, who died this day in 1977. She said, quote, Each friend represents a world in us, a world not born until they arrive, and it's only by this meeting that a new world is born. assassinated presidential candidate Robert Kennedy in 1968 was denied parole yesterday by the California governor. Kennedy, a U.S. senator and former attorney general, was shot moments after he won the California Democratic presidential primary. Five others were wounded in the attack. A panel of parole commissioners actually recommended Surhan, age 77, be freed. They cited his, quote, extensive record of rehabilitation, end quote. Two of Kennedy's sons also previously supported his release, while other siblings and their mother strongly opposed it. Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom called the assassination one of the most notorious crimes in American history. He added a statement that it caused great harm to the American people. The assassination shortly followed the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and also took place after Kennedy's brother, President John F. Kennedy, was killed. Newsom feels that Sir Ann lacks insight refuses to accept responsibility, and poses a risk of inciting further political violence. Saran will be scheduled for a new parole hearing no later than February of 2023. His attorney, Angela Berry, is asking for Newsom's denial to be overturned. California law says inmates should be paroled unless they pose a current and unreasonable public safety risk. Berry said the parole process is politicized and that Newsom ignored the law. Saran said during his hearing that he doesn't recall the shooting because he was drunk. He said, quote, it pains me, the knowledge for such a horrible deed, if I did in fact do that, end quote. A trial begins in the case of an Alaskan Native woman killed in the 1990s, and a new report by Native groups examines food insecurity amid the pandemic. With that story and more, it's Antonia Gonzalez with National Native News. This is National Native News. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. 
A trial for the rape and killing of an Alaska Native woman years ago began this week in Fairbanks, Alaska. The body of Sophie Sergi was found in the second floor bathroom of a dormitory at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 1993. DNA from her body was matched to Stephen Downs, who was a student living in the dorm at the time. KUAC's Robin reports. The case had been cold for decades after Alaska state troopers ruled out suspect after suspect in the years after the crime. But in 2018, a cold case investigator tested evidence from the crime against a commercial genealogy database and got a DNA match. Alaska state troopers worked with Maine police to arrest Stephen Downs at his home in Maine in 2019. Now 47 years old, Downs was only 18 and finishing his first year at University of Alaska Fairbanks at the time of the crime. Prosecutor Chris Darnell told the jury the DNA match would be the center of the state's case. But defense attorney James Hawanek said there was additional male DNA found on the victim that did not match the defendant, Stephen Downs. Sophie Sergi was 20 when she died. She grew up in the tiny Yupik village of Pitka's Point with about 100 people. She'd been studying marine biology at the university. The jury heard from the first witness, Shirley Acklecock, who grew up in the same school district as Sergi and worked with her on student leadership projects. If you were going to be a future leader for the community, it, it was known when you were young, you know, and everyone knew that that would, would be her. Acklecock told her story of that weekend in 1993 when she last saw her friend walk down the hall to have a cigarette. The court has applied strict rules to media recording of this trial, giving permission only on a case-by-case basis. For National Native News, I'm Robin. A recent report shows deepening food insecurity is gripping tribal communities amid the pandemic. The Mountain West News Bureau's Robin Vincent tells us more. Nearly half of Native Americans and Alaska Natives have experienced food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to a recent report from several Native-led organizations. Tony Stanger McLaughlin is with the Native American Agriculture Fund, which co-led the survey. The data that came out, especially from USDA, saying that COVID didn't impact food insecurity as much as they thought it had, that contradicted what we saw in our data. And our data was specific to Indian country. Last September, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released a report that said a social safety net helped prevent food insecurity from spiking to levels higher than the previous year. The survey didn't specifically list data for Native Americans. Stanger McLaughlin says Native-led organizations are best equipped to collect this kind of important data from their communities. For National Native News, I'm Robin Vincent. The first and second ladies of the Navajo Nation are hosting a virtual education series this week on resiliency, trauma, and healing. Dr. Marilyn Zimmerman with the National Native Children's Trauma Center says focusing on the resiliency of indigenous people supports healing. We have long histories, 10,000 years of surviving on in North America. So let's shift the narrative and honor our resiliency. Not what's wrong with you or what's happening to you. What's made you strong? What has helped you in your lifetime cope with some of these events that have occurred in your life? The educational series continues Friday online and will air on radio stations on the Navajo Nation. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. A survey released Thursday, January 13th, of 800 Ohioans concludes discrimination in health care is a common experience for people who are not white men. Mary Sherman reports. A new report suggests discrimination in medical settings affects the quality of care for many Ohioans. In a survey of more than 800 people, discrimination was not a rare experience. And for women and people of color, it was common. In the survey, black women reported feeling less respected twice as often as white men. And black men were four times more likely to report being harassed in a healthcare setting. Greg Braylock Jr. is Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer with ProMedica, a healthcare system based in Northwest Ohio. He says he isn't surprised by the findings. We've known in healthcare for decades that we've had disparities in how people experience healthcare, the outcomes that they have, but we have failed as an industry to sufficiently address these negative differences and outcomes that we see. Some 22% of those surveyed said they have accepted discrimination in medical settings as a way of life, but 24% said they didn't return for future appointments. 
which may mean delaying or avoiding needed care. Just 15% of people who said they felt discriminated against went on to file a complaint. The report notes many hospital systems have equity training, but few have anti-racism initiatives. Don Poland with the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition contends these efforts only scratch the surface of the problem. That training that we've done over the last 20, 30 years has brought us to this place where this survey is still necessary, where health is still a crisis, and where Black and African American people are dying daily because of the lack of services and their skepticism about engaging the hospital setting. Executive Director of the Ohio Unity Coalition, Pierrette Talley, bullies hospitals and other healthcare institutions have made a good start toward addressing racism. But she says they need to dig deeper than community forums, health fairs, and government-required anti-discrimination measures. They must be in touch with the community that they serve and work together to figure out what are the issues and how they can best be addressed so that we are rooting out racism at an institutional level and not just looking at some bad actors. The report was released by the Multi-Ethnic Advocates for Cultural Competency, the Ohio Unity Coalition, the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition, and UCAN Ohio. For Ohio News Connection, I'm Mary Sherman. Naturally occurring chemicals in hemp could help prevent the spread of COVID-19, according to new research from Oregon State University. KBOO's Doug McVeigh has more. A researcher at Oregon State University says that compounds in hemp may help to protect against COVID. I'm Richard Van Bremen, Professor of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Oregon State University. I'm also a member of the Linus Pauling Institute and the Global Hemp Innovation Center. And I'm interested in discovering natural products that have pharmaceutical benefits and can function as therapeutic agents. Over half of all drugs that we use today have their origins in nature and natural products. And there, I'm hoping tens of thousands more we, we can discover. Now, let's get one thing out of the way first. This is not about smoking or vaping, right? Correct. What we've discovered are cannabinoids that are in an acidic form, cannabidiolic acid, CBDA, CBGA, and THCA. And if these compounds are heat treated, they can lose that acidic group and convert to other molecules, also cannabinoids that have other properties, CBDA becomes CBD. And I'm sure many are familiar with CBD products on the market right now. Tell me about your new article. What prompted your research? Well, when COVID began, we started teaching remotely and some of the laboratories got shut down. And those labs that could keep operating, and at least in our campus, were focused on COVID research. And so we decided to turn our natural product drug discovery um, research group's attention towards finding new anti-COVID compounds. And this is the first of, we hope, many discoveries to come out of that work that's ongoing. And we decided to attack the COVID causing virus, the SARS coronavirus 2, at the entry point where it infects cells and so we were looking for compounds that could interfere with that recognition step where the spike protein of the virus attaches itself to the human cell. What did you find? We were fortunate to find some compounds in hemp. We, we tested many botanicals because uh, botanicals produce a lot of different natural products that are called secondary metabolites. And um, hemp in particular is one we wanted to test because it is more complex than many plants and produces a lot many unique compounds and many of the cannabinoids are unique to the hemp plant and in that work we were fortunate to discover three compounds in hemp that had particularly good binding activity and could attach to the spike protein of the coronavirus and that's the point at which it attaches itself to the human cell and so like an antibody but we're using a much smaller molecule from nature. We are able to block that interaction and stop the virus from entering the human cell in the very first step. What we're gonna do next, we're hoping to obtain funding to continue to test cannabinoids against Omicron and other new variants of the coronavirus. And we wanna to move towards clinical trials and do some pilot studies to establish the 
appropriate dosage forms to achieve blood levels that our data so far predict should be effective, and then to carry out studies of efficacy in partnership with clinicians. Dr. Van Bremen, thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was my interview with Dr. Richard Van Bremen. He's a professor of medicinal chemistry in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the College of Pharmacy at Oregon State University, a principal investigator at the Linus Pauling Institute, and a member of the Global Hemp Innovation Center. Dr. Van Bremen is one of the co-authors of an article entitled Cannabinoids Block Cellular Entry of SARS-CoV-2 and the Emerging Variants, which was published January 10, 2022 in the Journal of Natural Products. Reporting for KBU News, I'm Doug McVeigh. You're listening to the KBU Evening News for Friday, January 14th, 2022. This is a volunteer produced newscast, and we encourage your participation. Call or text us with your breaking news stories and tips at 971 245 2158. Our remote production team for tonight's newscast includes Josh Salem and Doug McVeigh. The producer is Althea Billings, and our engineer is Otto. Special thanks to Eric Tegetoff, Mary Sherman, Antonia Gonzalez, and Jonah Chester. The director of the Evening News is Althea Billings. A podcast of this newscast is available on our website at kboo.fm slash evening news. You are listening to KBOO Portland on 90.7 FM, K282BH Philomath on 104.3 FM, in K220HR Hood River on 91.9 FM. I'm Josh Salem. All of our KBU programs, including the evening news, are supported by our members. If you'd like to become a member and support your local community radio station, you can go to kboo.fm slash give or text KBU to 44321. Stay tuned now for Counterspin.